Hey, welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. My name is Mike Berdinsky. Somewhere on that split screen is Democratic Town Councilor Jason Zandrew. Jason, welcome back to the Citizen Mike Show. Uh, thanks for having me, Mike. So we're going to have some fun this episode. We're going to uh, cover a, a lot of ground in, uh, in, in a short period of time, but I want to start off um, with what everyone is talking about, what's going on with democratic politics. The, you know, there's rallies, articles in the paper, candidates everywhere knocking on doors, uh, I hear. So bring us up to date. What's cooking? Well, I, I, uh, the Democrat Town Committee has, you know, put out the uh, put out the feelers or put out the request that, you know, uh, we're looking for candidates that want to run for office. If you wanted to run for mayor or run for town council, run for board of ed or get involved, they were out and asking and trying to drum up, drum up interested people. And that's that's where it's been going on the past few weeks. So um, I hear I hear that you have more council candidates then there are six traditional positions on the ballot that nine may be running. Any, any truth to that for the council? Well, so, you know, just as a refresher, and, and you know, but, you know, and I don't know how many people in the audience know, we, each party and, and even unaffiliated if they wanted to, have the ability to run a full slate of nine. You can run nine for Board of Ed. You can run nine for town council. You can run one for mayor. So we, we do have nine people that have come forward that are interested in running for town council. Um, the Democrat Town Committee has a um, executive group. Um, I guess they're, they're called the Candidate Committee. They, they are strongly working towards only maintaining uh, six candidates that they're willing to bring forward to the entire committee to endorse. That means um, that three will be dropped off. What are the odds of one of those three that are not endorsed petitioning on the ballot as a Democrat so that when people go to the polls, they could see seven, eight, or even nine people running for town council as Democrats? What are the odds of that happening? Well, I guess I guess it depends. I guess it really depends on you know who who is chosen to run as as part of the endorsed slate of six, if they go that way, it sounds like they're going that way. And, and who is willing to petition? So, I mean, I, I can go to history where, you know, back in 2007, I felt disenfranchised. I ran as an unaffiliated council candidate. Um, uh, two or four, I think it was four years ago, uh, John Sullivan uh, also petitioned as an unaffiliated candidate. And you know, ran on that line, didn't win either. Uh, you go back about mm, six, see, six terms, 12 years ago, Nick Economopoulos wanted to run as a Democrat and he wasn't chose chosen, so he petitioned. So the petition process for the actual um, party line is, is effectively a, um, it, it's a primary. Now, when there's open seats, like when Nick ran, it's, it's a no vote primary because there's a valid seat. He gets the signatures, he goes on. So, and the reason I kind of went through the long explanation is because I, I go back to, it really depends on who doesn't get chosen. If it's a brand new person, they may just want to, you know, work another, you know, term, get to know the party, get to know the committee, get to know the voters and try again. If it's, a, if it's someone who's tried to run before, it has been turned down a couple of times, or it's someone that's been in office before, they may decide to take it to that petition line. Well, let's get specific. John Sullivan wants to run for the town council as a Democrat. Yeah? Yes, he's, yeah, he's, approached, he's approached the chair of the DTC, Alita Sella. Made an official. Has to be considered. Made an official statement. Yeah. Um, hey, we've both been around the block a little bit. We've read the newspapers from, you know, uh, a few years back. Uh, John Sullivan and the Democratic Town Committee did not part on good terms uh, a few years back. It seems to me the odds of John Sullivan being endorsed are zero. They also, it seems to me the odds of him petitioning on, getting enough signatures to run for town council as a Democrat, are excellent. So would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I would agree that if he's not selected, he will and he and he really wants to be, you know, go forward with a committed run, he could certainly choose that option to petition on for a primary seat, which right now is unchallenged. Yeah. Okay. So we may see 
uh, at least seven, at least seven Democrats running for council for for town council. I uh, yeah, I mean, if 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 what we're speculating comes to pass, sure. Yeah. Okay. It's not. We know this is this is more than speculation. This is informed speculation, right? <laughs> Even better. Well, I never, I never like to speak for anybody in particular, but I mean, if I was a betting man, I would expect to well, see more than six people running. There, there you go. Um, now, what about mayor? I, I understand the Democrats have more than one candidate running for mayor. I'm not talking about Vinny Testa now, but uh, aren't there two people interested yeah, in running for mayor? Yeah, correct. Two people have come forward that have an interest to run. Um, I believe that they, I don't want to suggest they're working together. They are part of the, uh, a, you know, the collective agreement that at this point, one will be chosen. And I really believe from, you know, my interactions with them, and, and it hasn't been a lot, it, it, I've been pretty busy, but it, my understanding is the other will likely gracefully step aside. This is the way that I kind of understand the the two candidates. If one's chosen, the other's not going to fight it, push it, or primary it. I, I believe they will acknowledge okay. the decision and accept it. So um, a decision a decision has to be made to take nine candidates and uh, winnow it down to six endorsed candidates. And you said the, the group that's going to do that is called what, the Central Committee? No, you call the Candidate Committee. I, yeah, so it's... Slip of the my, yeah, yeah. So my understanding is, you know, they, they we've all gone through a process of filling out a questionnaire and talking to some of the committee members. It's my under, you know, basically like an interview process, all of us, you know, incumbents and new people alike. And I really believe that what they're going to do is this committee is going to talk amongst themselves to say, you know, make making the selections, if you will, of what they believe are the six strongest candidates or best candidates or most well-rounded and bring it forward to the DTC who will either vote yes to support all six or no to support all six as a slate. Talk to me about the criteria. You're a little vague on that. I want, I want to zero in on the criteria. Well, I mean, you know, the, I, I want, I calling it a criteria is a little difficult. I mean, they, they have a platform that they're looking to put together the, the, the town committee itself, the, the executive officers, the executive board, that's going to, uh, be different challenges and things that they want to execute along the way. And they want their six candidates, shout, should they be elected, to push on this agenda to try to drive these things through for a better Wallingford. Okay. Um, the, is the agenda um, well known? Is the agenda out there? Is it online? Is it's, it, it's, uh... it's different things. It's different things that have been mentioned before, either by, you know, re, you know, the past couple of years by the committee. There are things that they brought up during Q&A at council meetings about things like community pool, um, wanting to have more broader and more rounded um, representation in town. There's There's been some different discussions on on how we are all at large candidates across the town and how some feel that that's not necessarily representative of everyone. And there's been a lot of back and forth on that topic. So there's different things that they're looking to do. Shall, should they get into a position to affect some of these changes? All right, so after the uh, endorsement process um, is, after the endorsed candidates are known, I guess the citizen might show revisit, revisit this, this criteria. We talked a little bit about the um, questionnaire with Vinny Testa. I've seen some positions online and um, some positions of individual candidates online. Um, I'm not sure it answers all my questions, but let's wait. But one of the positions I think that the Democratic Town Committee is united on is community pool. Uh, for two years, I've been saying community pool is dead. Excuse me dead as a door nail. So I don't understand, you know, why that's, uh, why that's a vote getter. Um, but maybe it rallies the base. Tell me, tell me what's going on with community pool from the town councilor's perspective, from the Democratic Town Committee's perspective. There's a rally on community pool, I guess, next weekend. Why? I mean, it, it, community pool's over, isn't it? What's, what's, what's the hope? Well, I, I, I acknowledge where, where your sentiment is coming from, that if the mayor doesn't want it to be reopened, it won't be reopened. And so I like to I like to take the page from it's not it's not over till it's over. So I, I feel like it's still there. It could be brought back. It could be you know, it could be revived. 
I mean, you know, we, we killed Simpson court parking 10 years ago and it came back and they won. So, I mean, I think if you look at community pool, there's a, there is still a very large presence of people that use it. Now, not large from the overall perspective of the population of Wallingford, but, you know, the two or 3,000 people that used to buy pool tags would buy them again if the pool was open. But the, in order for that pool to be open, it needs to be completely redone. And I, I think wanna, they- I don't want to get, get into all the background. We, we've covered the pool um, a lot a lot on the show. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I- I just wanted to get your view and share my view. My view is that it's dead. Uh, the Democratic Town Committee's view and your view, it's undead. It's kind of like a zombie pool. You just keep, you just keep talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, and eventually all of you die off. And it, you know, then it really is dead. And um, I think the position of the Citizen Mike Show is call, uh, pronounce community pool dead, and instead advocate for splash pads. But I. You know, that's just me. I, what, just your reactions to that. And then well, we'll, no, because I mean, actually, one of the designs was that, and it was my hope as part of that redesign that we would have a smaller pool footprint, but a bigger park. Yeah. Community pool wouldn't just be a pool; it would be a park. It would be an area to go to all year during warmer months. The splash pads would be available and open. I mean, we've had a number of eighty-five and ninety-degree days already where they would have been better utilized in the pool itself. So the, the park being open, the splash pads being on, kids could be in there and you could bring picnic lunches and so on. I think the entire redesign of it being a pool and a park is the way to go. And I think that's really where we need to look to the future. Yeah, I get, I get the pitch. I, I just wanted to make the point and then we'll move on. The pitch notwithstanding, folks, viewers of the Citizen Mike show is dead. It's over. It's gone. So move on to plan B or make political hay of the fact that, you know, it's still alive. But, you know, I, I don't like raising false hopes. I think, I think viewers, readers of the Record Journal, the public at large would be better informed if they understood it's dead as long as Mayor Dickinson is Mayor Dickinson. And, uh, you know, take it, everyone can make up their own mind whether he'll be reelected or not. But it is dead. So... Let's move on to something else. Uh, speaking of pool, park, and rec, you know, a month or so ago, or maybe a little more, it was a big issue in town. I think it was in the front page of the Record Journal at least once, a couple of follow-up stories about the fee schedule that the park and rec was going to charge nonprofits. And there was a proposed fee schedule put out by um, the Parks and Recreation Department it almost made it to the town council agenda for you guys to approve pursuant to a new ordinance that you passed. The mayor pulled it off because he didn't like some stuff that was park and rec did. And that hasn't come back. The issue of fee schedules hasn't come back. We're almost in the summer season. Leagues and, and nonprofits may be looking to book their park facilities. And because there hasn't been an approved fee schedule, they're going to get it for free. Where before they did, before they had to pay a little something. Your thoughts on what I just said? Yeah, I don't. I don't know why we haven't seen that. I mean, I I agree with your sentiment. The fact that you know we they had a schedule to put together for us to either approve or 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 adjust, and then it just went away. And I don't know if that was done in, intentionally to, for a legitimate review, um, if it was done with the idea of this is the wrong time to do it. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I really can't read all the tea leaves. I just know that I haven't been presented with anything to review and vote on. Um, I want to talk to you also about um, a report uh, by the architects for the school system, the school district, a report on a concept for one high school. And uh, there was some, a comment in the, in the uh, record journal about there being one auditorium that would fit about half the student body. I wanna talk about that, but before we get to that, you have the whole issue of, well, if you don't want one high school, then it's all irrelevant. If you're a two high school guy, we don't have a problem. Just renovate both high schools to new. You know, that means refurbish both auditoriums in Sheehan High School and at Lyman Hall. 
Um, so you got to get over the hump of going from two high schools to one high school. In the most recent reporting by the Record Journal, Superintendent of Schools, Sal Menzo, and, um, and one or more Republican Board of Ed members seem to be strongly in favor of one high school if done right. What are the odds of that happening? And then I want to circle back to this auditorium, which caught my eye. Sure. So, I mean, I, I look at it, I look at it from a couple of different, through a couple of different lenses, if you will. So first off, I, any opinion that I have is my personal opinion because yeah, the board we want that. that's right. why you're on the show. It's an opinion show. We got to have your personal opinion. Right. We, it. Well, we want it. That's why you're here. And, and that's why I wanted to preface that because I will, I will, whatever my opinion is, yeah. I'm going to look at whatever the board of ed gives us. And then I will weigh in on, on the, what they give us to vote on. But it, in my thought process and the way that I try to approach everything I do when it comes to the town and the tax dollars, the people's money has always been, if we can save money by consolidating efforts in use, in other words, park and rec doing something and, and letting, you know, the, uh, you know, maintenance help out with it, you know, or public works help out. This is all a consolidation of costs. So having two, two high schools, when maybe we can get away with one might be an avenue we want to take a look at when we get to ultimate cost. And what I mean by ultimate cost is to renovate two schools might cost us $30 million less overall, but then we're not getting everything we need to have done. And we're still going to be maintaining two buildings for 30 more years. And, and I understand the entire part of the rivalry and tradition. I'm a big tradition guy. I mean, I, I didn't want to let the fireworks die when they did away with them. But to tradition at cost, you have to actually ask yourself, do you want to saddle yourself as a taxpayer or your, your friends and neighbors and businesses with an add-on cost just for the sake of tradition? Southington has a single high school that is effectively twice the size or the combined size of Sheehan and Lyman Hall. If the decision gets made to have one high school in Wallingford, we could certainly do it built correctly. If we're looking at tradition and honoring the buildings on which they're named, you could have a Sheehan academic wing and a Lyman Hall, whatever wing. Oh. There's ways to do it. There's still ways to do it and have it called the Wallingford High School or whatever you want to call it. No, we're going to, no, this has been decided. The name of the high school has been decided. You weren't at that meeting. You did not. No, I wasn't. That. No, you it's the William Dickinson Jr. High School. That's the name of the of the new high school. Look, um, but I want to get back uh, to pulling your teeth on your view. Yep. If the Board of Education uh, never comes back because they never reach their consensus, is how they politely put it. They're they're just in such so, such chaos, uh, stalemated. Uh, they never come back. You're off the hook. If they come back and they say two high schools, please. We want funding. Then it's obvious you go with two high schools. If they say one high school can't promise you it's going to save money, we're not doing it for money. We're doing it for a better academic experience. We're doing it for uh, educational equality. Uh, there are other, other motivations, uh, but it, an accountant is not making the decision for us. We think academically one high school is better, and that's Sal Menzo's argument. They recommend by a divided vote. It looks like the Democrats on the board of ed are lagging behind and may vote no, and the Republicans looks like are more enthusiastic about one high school. But the board of ed comes in front of you with a divided vote and recommend one high school. What do you vote? How do you vote? Uh, if if I've got if I've got nothing else to go on other than the academics piece and that yes. it's going to be better for the better for the kids. Yes. That's what it's supposed to be about anyway, at the very, very root and bottom of the truth. If it's if it's coming forward as, hey, this is going to be better for the these next generations of students coming out of that one place, then I'm all for it. Got if it. it's going to be on or about the same amount of money. I, uh, that, I'll take that as a good, clear, clean answer. Now let's talk about an auditorium. This, this kind of knocked my socks off. The reporting of the Record Journal is that the new, the new auditorium in this one new high school, and by the way, just to clear this up, I'm in, I'm in favor of, of, of one high school if done really, really well. I, I mean, if it's a knock your socks off trophy high school that can t carry us for the next 20 or 30 years, um, I'm, I'm in favor of that and I'm not in favor of let's cut a corner here and let's cut a corner there and make it less than what it could be, then I, I don't like the whole idea. But I see this, this auditorium that houses half the student body. I said, what are you doing? 
if the if the um, the high school wants to address the, the new unitary high school wants to address the entire student body on something very momentous, maybe something happens nationally, internationally, maybe it's a, a health issue that affects the entire student body. First of all, get the whole high school in there at one time. And second of all, this could be a state of the art venue for entertainment, entertainment for the high school, high school plays, high school concert, high school bands, uh, school system wide entertainment, and also could be a revenue source if uh, entertainment, commercial entertainment wants to come in and rent that you would have a first class, it should be built as a first class stage, theater, curtains, light, sound. I don't have the right vocabulary right now, but something you could be proud of to put on a, you know, a, a very worthy presentation, the whole community could go see, not just half the, might, not just half the school body. It'd be a civic site, and maybe that would help gain acceptance to this one high school concept from the entire community. Your thoughts on what I just said? No, I agree. I, I, I mean, I remember my time going to middle school and high school here in Wallingford. I went to Moran. I went to Sheehan. And, and everybody fit in the auditorium. And I, I think that's important because if you're going to bring people together for any type of a large announcement, forget normal assemblies, but like the examples that you just, just gave, you need to be able to bring everybody together. Not There's not going to be two waves of people to come in that president has passed away or uh, a, a, the new, the next space shuttle never made it, ma never made it home, or whatever the story might be. I think that's important, and I, I don't know that you're going to save a whole lot of money by cutting that corner, like you said. And I agree, there could be other uses beyond academics that could be that could be bringing people into an auditorium of a full size like that to be able to house and maintain everybody inside it. Yeah, I think it could help put Wallingford on the map. And uh, Wallingford, Wallingford talks a lot about economic development. I do not want to digress into that topic because it could get us dragged down. But as host of the show, I get privileges. But a, a great school system uh, and, and great civic opportunities is an economic development play when executive or if executives want to cite their business and their employees and their families in a new location. Um, I, you know, I think the family gets in the family car, drives around the town that is the possible new location of this business, uh, and they see what the town has to offer. They look at the school system. So the real estate agent would drive by the school system and say, that's Wallingford's new high school. And right. the executive of this 500 employee high tech business say, whoa, Wallingford's a happen in place. You know, hey, what do you think kids about moving here? I, I mean, I think that's all. It's all part of the fabric of economic development that's often lost uh, when we talk about asphalt and you know and concrete and and new businesses. Uh, this can be this can be a magnet. Okay, um, let's change subjects uh, a little bit as we touched on economic development, and that rhymes with data centers. It rhymes. It kind of does. So, <laughs> a lot has happened uh, with respect to. Uh, uh, data centers, we spent a lot of time on the last show talking about it, but much of what's happened has happened in executive session. It's secret, got to stay secret. That's the way Wallingford uh, does things. I think most people watching this episode know now what a data center is, big building that houses uh, computer equipment and switching equipment. Um, they're big buildings on big pieces of land that make a little too much noise, but maybe that's manageable. It looks like they're, they're not looks like, they're required to pay a host fee, a host fee is a payment in lieu of taxes. They don't draw a lot of traffic, some, but you know it's not a big traffic generator. Um, the, the the host fee um, seems to be based on the number of buildings. At least that's what Groton and uh, Basra have done. Um, it looks like a standard form agreement. Not much left to negotiate. Um, and I'm going to tell you what I think of them, and then we'll go to you, and you've got the next whatever. Uh, I think I think uh, data centers are great. Um, we got to be uh, we got to manage the noise problem. I don't know why this noise issue was handled in secret. Uh, you're doing well. Yeah, yeah, you all nine of you and the mayor and Tim Ryan do this wanting for the service by saying not in so many words. We have a noise problem. We talked about it thoroughly in executive session. We're not going to tell you what the noise problem is. That's a secret. So you're left to your own insecurities and suspicions. But it was serious enough to hire a, a sound consultant. We're not going to tell you why. We're not going to tell you what he's going to do because that's all secret. So 
Jason, why did you hire a sound consultant? What are you guys afraid of? Well, I think I, <laughs> less than being afraid, I, I think that the, the discussion that came up around, around noise is our noise ordinance. We've had issues with that in the past, and I don't think they were um, it, not even just adhered to. They, the warnings were not listened to. There was, you know, earlier on with other construction near residential zones, there was a lot of red flags put up by the, by the very owners and developers of those parcels saying, look, we're business, we're growing and we're gonna make even more noise. We're around our limits. So, you know, we're pushing the maximum threshold of what we're allowed to admit. And it's still gonna be irritating to some people that live nearby. And so you need to take this in consideration if you're gonna allow residential development right up to our back door. So oh, now you've got an area. What's this, noise, not, what's this noise consultant gonna do for Wallingford? Well, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm under the impression that this person is supposed to come in and be able to identify how far, what noise will travel across those parcels and how it drops off as, as you reach those residential areas. Okay. Um, so for that, he would need to study that. He would need specifics, I, I would think. He would need to, he would need to understand, you know, the size of, you know, the, the generators, the air conditioning units, how they're going to be housed, where they're going to be placed, right. the terrain on the ground between the building itself and whatever it's encased in. And as it, as you traverse distance, how that sound is absorbed or it falls off as it moves away. Okay. So I'm going to move to the, to the money in a minute, but I want to get polish finish up with this noise issue. Um, maybe the worst thing that ever happened to Wallingford as they passed a noise ordinance. Maybe, I'm not sure, but I, I think in, in my humble opinion, if a, a neighborhood has to rely on the noise ordinance to protect the character of its neighborhood, it's like screwed. Uh, the noise ordinance seems now, it's designed to permit uh, a lot of noise rather than the prohibit the annoying noise, uh, annoying noise. And if the protection is the noise ordinance, um, it's basically unenforceable legal noise under the noise ordinance is too much so i'm a little i'm a little worried that in private you guys say well it's the noise ordinance that is the relevant standard and it should not be that it should be a lot less noise than that i'm still convinced that the noise can be managed but if you add noise ordinance into that sentence or into that paragraph now i'm saying i guess maybe it can't be managed and i can I can see a developer coming in and say, we can get under your noise ordinance. And everyone says, oh, well, that's good. But that's terrible. That's all. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, no, I understand where you're going and I agree with you. I, 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 like, I like ordinances that allow us to have a definitive barrier. And the reason I say it like that, and I, and I agree, a lot of times they'll look at it, well, we don't need to do baffling because we'll be under the noise ordinance. And we don't need to do this because we'll be under the noise ordinance. But I, I like to look at it from the other perspective. If people have an issue and there's no, it, since we're just discussing noise, if there's no noise ordinance, then it's subjective if it's too loud or not, or if people can sleep or not. So what should happen is we should have the ability to go in and say, we want to we wanna keep it as quiet as possible. The noise ordinance should be like the maximum thing that they should be considering. And we're looking to get it as quiet and as reasonably responsible as a certain amount of money will allow. But, but if the neighbor calls up and says, listen, that's too loud, what's the barometer? His opinion, her opinion, or the police officer's opinion? It has to be some discernible amount, and that's where the ordinance comes in. Um, yeah, so it could be that uh, the host agreement deals with noise in some way. Uh, not the noise ordinance, which is a matter of in, uncertain enforcement and proof. But if it's in the host agreement, it, it's, it's a matter of contract and you don't have to rely on planning and zoning or something like that. It's a contractual obligation um, that could set its own, own standards. But I don't think noise levels are going to be part of this host agreement. Do you agree with that? Well, they probably won't, but I'll be looking for something. I mean, what I would like to ask of the sound consultant is, what's the ambient noise out there right now? If you stand out in the middle of the field and if you move 50% of the distance towards, towards a neighborhood and you do readings, traffic, you know, wind, everything, else, what's, what's the decibel level there? And I'll make up a number. Let's say it's 30. And let's say the, the maximum decibel level during the day based on the noise ordinance is 60. 
then what can we do to keep it 45 and under? Let them have the, the wiggle room to come up half the difference, but not get past that. And then at nighttime, if it's 50 and the normal nighttime is 20, then you allow them to come up half the difference to that yeah. and, and make that part of the agreement that, you know, other than maybe short accidental bursts over the agreed upon amount, they certainly won't reach the ceiling, but they're, they're being requested to maintain their average sound levels at 50% of the differential of what it is today to the, to the maximum of this ordinance. Good thinking. Um, I don't want to spend too much time and probably have already because um, I think the noise should be the tail of the dog. And I think it's, I think it's manageable if handled properly. I think it's Wallingford's to lose, you know, if they botch the noise issue. Um, I agree. This is this, uh, you know, I, I do, I, I do think it can be managed uh, if Wallingford does not rely on the noise ordinance. If yeah. They no, start relying I, on the noise ordinance. As they say, they've screwed the neighborhoods. Uh, you know, if that's how it's going to turn out. Yeah. I agree. Um, but this is being done for money, basically, and. Um, what what you guys discussed in executive session, uh, I'm sure was Groton and probably Basra, and you went over their fee schedule. Um, the typical data center buildings, if built, if operational, would come at a revenue to the to the town of a million bucks per building. Um, again, the building would have to be built; it'd have to be operational, you know, and, and permits issued. Is that enough? Is that a good price? Yeah, I thought it was based on the amount of kilo uh, the megawatts or kilowatts that they were generating they were going to utilize. There's a there's a three there's a three step process. I don't want to get too detailed. Yeah, okay. But, okay. but a small size a small size generator, uh, I think pays five hundred thousand. The middle size, which I think Got Space is proposing, is the million dollar building, yeah. and if it's a bigger building, it's a million five under the fee schedule of uh, Groton and uh, and Basra. I assume Wallingford is walking down the, the same road. That seems pretty attractive. I'm not being sarcastic here. Shouldn't we be glad for that? Or, or should we hold up for more? Well, I, I think we have to look at, you know, potentially what we could build over in those areas someday in the future, um, whether or not we get something built today. Um, you know, I, I, I know that they're going to be doing some improvements to the um, high voltage power system over there because they need to interconnect to it and they're actually going to be doing some substation work over there. So that's, you know, that's a cost that they're going to take on. And I think there's other things that we can look at. I know that a couple of comments were made about the roadways in the area. You know, we can make all that part of the agreement. Listen, if you're going to come in here and build this and we know we're going to get some pilot money, it's not as much as maybe we could get if we could tax the building. How about, how about talk, let's talk about widening the road and, and getting that on your dime. I think if we're, if we're going to be doing some some type of you know agreement with them, why not get a wider road? Why not get better drainage or whatever we can maybe include that makes sense and it's not like asking for the moon? Okay, well we'll watch for that. Uh, Mr. Quinn, who represented Godspace at the council meeting where, where this came up, ruled out road improvements. He said we don't do them, uh, so I don't know, um, but it's something to watch, you know, to see if uh, if that ends up in the in the agreement. Um, the, the host agreement that we've been talking about has to be approved by the Wallingford Town Council. Uh, and it, it seems based on comments that were made publicly, uh, the administration is continue, going to continue negotiating. They'll come to the Wallingford Town Council with a finalized agreement for you to approve um, for an up or down vote. Um, any chance at amendments or renegotiation will be illusory. I mean, that's how it works. All the big agreements you've ever been involved in, Covanta, and I mean, just everything when you go back in time, this is, and maybe the mayor passes it out to you on the same night, I don't know. You know, so you don't have a chance to study it. That's, there's precedent for that too. Um, your thoughts going forward on the process well, I agree. I, I agree. We're, we're, I mean, we've all had our different thought processes on what we'd like to see. And again, if they need the votes to do this, then they, they better make sure they've got five counselors satisfied with the outcome. I mean, there's there's been a lot of discussion on the council about it, and not everybody's in alignment. Some people are just off the alignment just because of the diesel generators for backup and for peak shaving. Oh, it's too noisy, it's too pollution, and and so on and so forth. So you've got those are those people are already frowning upon it. So if you're talking about 
If you're talking about, hey, you know, this counselor would like to be a little quieter and this counselor would like maybe to take care of some drainage and you don't have enough yes votes and it goes, then it doesn't happen either. So why wasn't that discussion in public? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not, that's above my pay grade. I, I often don't understand why sir, there's usually one little element in a discussion that meets the criteria for executive session. And I agree that if we stayed on that topic, talked about that one thing, then we finish up with that. We could bring it back outside for the public to hear. And that's not generally how it goes. Yeah. A lot of discussion happens. There's very little recap when we come out. There's no public there sometimes to ask questions and then. Right, I, I hear you. And I, and I think um, my, my impression is the Wallingford Town Council and the administration and the Corporation Council, Jana Small, um, love secrecy so that they can get a little hook. If they can get a little hook to get into executive session, um, that opens the door in executive session to a wide and broad discussion, most of which should be long in public. Um, I would uh, respectfully suggest, though, that that's not a legal problem. That's a skills issue. Here's what I mean. Someone needs to have the skills to, to separate out, filter out that which is legitimate executive session material and that which is dr dragged in to executive session, but could easily be discussed in public. But I think the, the leadership of these meetings uh, profess not to have the skills to separate the issues. What can we do in public? Uh, how do we separate what is truly executive session material from uh, what is not? And they take the position, it's all intermingled, inextricably linked. It's all so muddy, we can't separate oil from water, so it all has to go in executive session. That's poopycock, which is worse than poppycock, and that's a skills issue, not a legal issue. So um, let's talk about, I wanna change the subject down before we get too bogged down. I wanna talk about zoning. And I, in preparing for the show and thinking about the show, uh, I was remembering back to the, an impression that was left when this was discussed publicly, the impression was data centers meet zoning. So, you know, I like to re-engineer stuff and read stuff for myself, and I couldn't find where that's true. Um, maybe it is, and I'm, you know, waiting for someone to, to follow up uh, on that, but it looks like data centers are not a permitted use either in the IX zone or the I-5 zone, which is that land near the interchange of Route 68 and Route 91 where the hotels are, and um, the school bus depot is, and things like that. So it would require um, a change in zoning or some action by the Planning and Zoning Commission. No problem. Planning and Zoning Commission gets together and they vote to add data centers in. Not a problem at all, just a mere inconvenience and a mere delay. Then I got to thinking, you know, Citizen Mike, you're supposed to be the devil's advocate and stir the pot to kind of ferret out perspectives and some clear thinking and, and, and additional facts. So my, my stir the pot suggestion Councilor Zandri, what would ever happen if the Planning and Zoning Commission changed the zone to make it residential? Well, that would end the data centers there. But it would add possibly houses and character of the neighborhood, and they would be taxed too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, not a good idea, though, right? We want to keep that. Well, I think I, I mean, I'm, not if I'm, looking for, I'm stirring the pot. Right, right. Well, if, I, if I'm looking, if, if it's me and I'm looking for the first best use for that area, even though there is some residential and we're bordering Meriden too, and then on the other side, Williams Road, I, I would want to be able to set that up like a, a area that could be more commercialized and, you know, something like a Clinton Crossing. If we're going to make a change over there, maybe make it something like a Clinton Crossing type area where you could put in shops and put in restaurants. And, and the, you know, the arguments the past arguments have been, but if you do that, no one will get off, you know, no one will come down from the highway and go down to Route 5. And I argue people follow the Route 5 corridor to begin with. And it, there's people that follow the highway corridor. So the people that go to the people that go to the Clinton crossing down in Clinton right now, don't go down the Route 1. The people that are over on Route 1 often don't come over to Clinton crossing or Brantford crossing. Yeah. So I mean, I think you bring new people that shop at a different type of store and they might wander to the center of Wallingford and get something, but they might not, but they'll definitely shop and eat off the interchange. And then maybe if they're driving through a neighborhood, they'll buy a house here someday. 
Yeah. Um, if, if we're looking at first best use of that area and we're going to maybe manipulate zoning a little bit, change some of the rules, I would go to more, more commercial before I went to residential. That's just what I would do. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I was trying to ferret out some of those thoughts and I would yeah. throw in residential as the trigger for your, that's what well, triggered me. <laughs> good, good. Um, let's talk about uh, a retrospective on the budget that was passed. Uh, we've covered the budget pretty thoroughly on previous episodes of the Citizen Mike show, but maybe not so much as a retrospective. And I did not want to get into the details of the budget. Everyone watching this show has a general idea as to, as to what happened. Uh, the mill rate is a little lower because of the council's action. The mill rate is a little lower uh, as, uh, as compared to the mayor's proposed mill rate. Um, there's a potential that the general fund balance uh, would go down. Not necessarily true, but there's a potential the general fund balance would go down as a result of, of this budget. Pickleball money is is in the budget, but that doesn't mean you get pickleball overnight. But this was the second year in a row when those unruly town councilors didn't do what they were told, rebelled against the mayor, passed their own budget. And, and I just sense something is different uh, now that, over the last two years that the mayor isn't taking it seriously, his hand-wringing and doom and gloom arguments are not hitting home as maybe they once did 10, 15 years ago. Um, that, I don't know, uh, that, 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 the, that the leadership, which is part art of persuasion, I mean, part of leadership is persuading and coaching people to your point of view and getting people to see the wisdom of what, you know, how you would like to do things. That's part of leadership. I, I'm just not seeing it. Um, Tell me your thoughts on what I just said. Well, I, I've always advocated that we could, we could do a little bit better tightening up the numbers. And, you know, there's been years where I've tried to come forward with stuff like that. And I was always, I was always tasked with show us where, what numbers would you cut, what line items. And I had to do a lot of that personally. So the methodology changed uh, last, last, uh, a fiscal year, and they they kind of went broad with the, holding the holding the mill rate down. And I was on board. I was on board with it because I know that we leverage, we uh, allocate from the general fund balance a number to help back in money to the budget that we would otherwise have to collect through fees or taxes. And we often don't use it. It's allocated there for use, but we often don't use it. And sometimes we use some of it but we often don't even use a third of it. So the idea was if you make it bigger and you still only use a third of it, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you, if you have $6 million allocated and you use a million, it doesn't matter whether you had 6 million or 12 million or 18 million allocated if you only use the 1 million. That was a legitimate use of some of that, that money allocated and then the rest went back. But my concern's been right along that there are often years we allocate we return and then we add. And that add is from tax dollars that we didn't spend, we didn't consume, but we still charge the people for. Yeah. And, I, and I've, I've got issues with that. I've always had issues with that. Yeah, I, I wanted to get it though from the perspective of where does that, where does that leave the mayor? I mean, does, does, it seem, does it seem that he doesn't have the same grip on things that he that he did before. And let me ask another question and you can fold answers to both into the same answer. You can only do this so many times, um, use money from uh, you know, the general fund to, to offset taxes, to, to not uh, put as much money into the capital non-recurring fund for capital projects as, as you might. You know, after a while, it becomes a, you know, an old story that can't repeat indefinitely. So, one, where does this leave the mayor, the, the mayor's prestige and power of persuasion? And two, you've done something like this two years in a row. I mean, come on, you, you can't keep doing this three years, four years, and five years in a row. Well, so again, I look at it like the, the budget's put together. And so we've got a final number. We've out, we, you know, we've got a budget of 100 and I think it's $177 million. And a chunk, a piece of that is from allocated funding. So if the entire budget of what we get from the state, collective taxes, fees, and so forth gets consumed, and we start going into this, you know, allocation, you're right. 
once we reach the other side of the allocation or we're down to the last, you know, four or $500,000 of a six or $7 million allocation, now you're consuming it. You have gotten to the point where you're using it up and that you certainly cannot repeat. And that is showing that we do need to either bolster the taxes or bolster the fees. So this goes back to that, that setup of how are we spending the money? What are we spending it on? And how efficient or is it of a best use? And so, yeah, you get back around to how are we executing across those different departments? And that's where you're really looking at the needs. And there's a lot of needs coming up. We're talking about the water treatment plant, the schools and everything. And these things are going to be bonded. and It's going to be a bigger burden because all those bond payments get put in as part of the budget as well. So yeah, these are things that we have to look at in the future. And that's why the community pool is dead in part, because there's going to be some big bonding projects. And the mayor will always say the time isn't right. And Vinny Cervoni will say the time isn't right. And there you go. So um, contributory reason why community pool is dead. I want to get back to the data centers for a minute, because there's something I wanted to uh, bring up. A happy, a happy coincidence, you know, um, the at the public presentation when Mr. Quinn from Dot Space uh, presented, he brought it as lawyer Len Fasano. Um, Len Fasano is a Wallingford favorite, right? I mean, a strategic choice. He didn't bring in a silk stocking firm from Hartford or Stanford or something like that. Brought in a local boy, um, thinking that that would work. You know, that would persuade you that. Len Fasano would not be presented with any tough questions because he's Len Fasano. Yeah, that's how government works. I mean, that's just the way it is. So when I was um, preparing for the show and um, looking into the data center issues a little bit, I went to the town clerk's uh, online portal to see exactly what was on the land records. And um, uh, Lawrence, of course, from the Record Journal uh, got to that issue and put a little bit in, in her article. Nine contracts were signed. Uh, the dates of the contract, I, I believe, were back in, uh, in February. Um, but also the land records reveals that the local attorney handling nine real estate contracts, you know, covering multi parcels, it's a nice, nice bit of legal work. Um, looks like representing God Space locally was uh, Jim Lachlan, who has the same office space as Vinnie Cervoni. Walk me through how that happens. They pick a, a list of all the local lawyers that do real estate in Wallingford and put a dart in the dartboard and sort of, you know, the, the good friend of Vinnie Cervoni pops up. What, what's going on here? I, uh, you know, I, that, I, I, I can't answer that because, I, you know, I don't know what went through the process. I mean, if you want to be speculative about something like that, you could you could say, gee, that that that's awfully peculiar. I mean, and it could be genuine, too. I mean, they may have you may have done work with the, the firm or somebody in the firm before, you know, with got space prior. I I really don't know. But I mean, you know, you, you have to take it at face value and then make a decision based on that. I mean, could it have been a handoff. I don't know. I mean, it, again, you know, they're they're both attorneys. They're both in the area. Choices get made, you know, Laughlin's known in the area, Fasano's known in the area, Cervoni sits on town council, he's also a lawyer. Or that's how government works. Maybe that's, you know, common sense may dictate here. That's just how government works. Um, that, uh, uh, that, that somehow through his political friendships, uh, the attorney doing the local real estate work uh, through his, as they say, political connections ends up with the business. That is how politics politics works in government. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree, but I also take it even, you know, I, I work in the private sector, I work in technology. So, I mean, I'm going to go to other people in technology if I have a technology challenge. If I wanted to get some questions answered on Got Space, I'd go to the people that I know. Yeah. Find out, hey, what do you guys know about Godspace? I've never heard of them before. I want some more information on them. And you, hey, you you live in Burlington where they were before. Can you tell me anything about when they came to your neighborhood or they're not there yet and they've already had this guy? I mean, I would go to my people before I went to lawyers. I mean, so sometimes that's just the way that things work. And not, not everything is bad and nefarious, I guess. Or I'd like to believe so. Um, 
you, you're on a short leash on this last one because uh, we're <laughs> running out of time. What do you think of uh, after Mayor Dickinson goes, what do you think about a town manager form of system? Town manager would answer to the council. You could have a ceremonial mayor or even a, a mayor coming uh, from the council with a, enhanced powers, but day-to-day -day operation of the, of the town, budgets, supervising department heads, that kind of thing be run by a professional, a town manager, might be under a two, three, four year contract, uh, that kind of a setup. Um, Southington has that, Meriden has that, Cheshire has that. I think most towns across the country, um, most towns the size of, of Wallingford has a town manager system. Political parties don't like that, I don't think, because the political insiders want their guy to be in the seat of power after lusting for the mayorship for 30 or 40 years. They're not going to abandon that on behalf of the people of Wallingford when they see political power, you know, within their uh, within their sights. Um, what do you think about a town manager? I think I think it's inevitable. I mean, I think we're, we're first off, the way towns function and work in the 21st century is far different than the way they used to work. And it's, you know, we're not a little town anymore. We're, and, and I mean that in multiple ways, population wise, sure. But, you know, our budget is, is huge compared to what it used to be. It's probably correctly sized for our population and for our services. But this is not something that, you know, I mean, for lack of a better way to say it, no matter what the person's political skill is, someone is elected for their political knowledge, their savvy, their, their connections, their popularity, that doesn't necessarily translate to an awesome CEO type manager of 177 million. We're, we're a company, we're the town of Wallingford, like a company. And if I had a company that was $177 million, I would want the best CEO there, not the most popular, not the best communicator. I would want the person that's going to get the best job done. And sometimes that's not up for election. That's up for hire. We do that with to a degree with a $200,000 um, superintendent of schools. You know, we pay them very well to, to be the best they can be, and they're contractually obligated to perform. Uh, an elected mayor that's popular, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily speaking to Mayor Dickinson, any popular mayor who's good with the kids and shows up at school and and speaks strongly when he needs to and stands on ceremony can be reelected year after year after year and do an okay job with the money. But we could have somebody that is driven to do an awesome job because they're being motivated by their personal pay and their, their experience to do the job. And that's something that you may not be able to convey to people during an election. And it's much better if it is a hired person. So I would be in favor of reviewing that at some point in the future after, after you know, we see the sunset on, on Mayor Dickinson, however that comes. Let's make that the final word because we're running out of time. Time flies, we're having a good time. So thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate some, uh, some good answers and, and, and frank answers that, um, that you gave us. I want to thank the viewers too for uh, checking in on the Citizen Mike show. We uh, produce these, well, you never know when we produce them, but they're up on YouTube, usually the same day or maybe the next day. Go to the Citizen Mike uh, Wallingford channel. Uh, I promote the show on the various, your Facebook pages, uh, usually, actually. And we want to thank WPAA and Susan Heizenga for broadcasting the Citizen Mike show um, on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, maybe different shows. Uh, at night at night, we used to say if it's night at night, it's Citizen Mike. Thanks, WPAA. Thanks again, Jason. See you next time around. Thanks a lot for having me.